Welcome back to Historical Context. Today we continue our colonization of New England unit and we're continuing to talk about Plymouth which now finds itself in a little state of distress. It's amazing how things went from great in the fall of 1621 to awful really by the start of 1623. Everything that could possibly go wrong seems to be doing so for the Plymouth Pilgrims. Everything from food supply to relations with the natives to relations amongst each other as this Weston colony shows up and gets started in Massachusetts Bay and is clearly not representing the English very well. And as they start 1623, the Pilgrims are without their English-speaking guide Squanto, who died the year prior. And now the Weston colony is in threat of starving to death. Bradford alleges that the Weston colony overconsumed what they had, overtraded, and he specifies this by saying they gave up clothing and bedding for food. So think about that. So now they have practically no comforts. And members of the Weston colony even started to act as servants to the natives in order to receive food. So the behavior was really changing there, and the Weston colony was becoming direly desperate uh, just, to, just to survive. Others in the Weston colony, Bradford admits, were actually stealing from the natives. And again, this cannot be good. This is not going to help any of the, the pilgrims' uh, relations with natives. The Weston colony had also scattered into the countryside, living off of nuts and clams. I mean, they had practically given everything up just to survive, and so now, if you went there, they were scattered all about the place. In one case, members of the Weston colony hung one of their own men to appease the natives because the man would not stop stealing from them. And so, I mean, it was just nuts basically uh, Lord of the Flies and had some similar undertones to Jamestown only the Jamestown colony did not uh, behave in ways to appease anyone uh, they they tended to just do what they wanted to do to survive meanwhile at Plymouth word was received that Massasoit the chief was sick and near death a pilgrim envoy went with gifts and he was able to recover. So, uh, you know, that's a good thing, too. We, uh, we talked about at Jamestown how Chief Powhatan and his death led some things to unravel. So Massasoit and his uh, survival was important to the Plymouth uh, Pilgrims and their relations. At that time when they were there visiting him and he was recovering, he let them in on a conspiracy. Let's have a look. Quote, a conspiracy amongst the Indians of Massachusetts and other neighboring tribes to wipe out Mr. Weston's people in revenge for their continual injuries they did them, taking opportunity of their weakness to do it, and believing that the people of New Plymouth would avenge their death, they decided to do the same by them, and solicited Massasoit to join them. He advised the New Plymouth Settlement to prevent it by speedily capturing some of the chief conspirators before it was too late. So now you have a real problem here. Clearly the Plymouth Pilgrims have been looped in with Weston's men in the eyes of the natives and they are ready to attack both colonies. Interestingly enough, shortly thereafter a man defected from Weston's colony and came to Plymouth and stated that he felt a massacre was imminent. After much deliberation, William Bradford sent Miles Standish to rescue the surviving Weston colonists and kill some of the native conspirators. This is a situation that is judged in a variety of ways in our contemporary history. 
And so I want people to understand the context surrounding those events and the decision of the pilgrims uh, to kill some natives. It could not have been taken lightly because it had really not happened up until that moment, even with the man uh, named Corbatant. And so Bradford decides to do this and uh, according to Edward Winslow in his second book, Good News from New England, which I, I don't know how much of this is good news, two of the five native conspirators were actually killed. So Plymouth was on the offensive here by killing these native conspirators. They did have a native that they were holding hostage that they agreed to release in exchange for three Englishmen who were being held hostage by the natives. But when they released this native, a female native came back and reported that, regrettably, the three hostages had already been killed before, uh, before the native messenger arrived. So it was kind of like one of those weird things where, uh, I guess it got crossed in the mail as the native was going out to be released to do the trade, the three hostages were killed. So now you have situations where the natives are being killed by the colonists and the colonists are being killed by the natives. By this time, the Massachusetts natives were considered enemies of the English. All of this because of Weston's arrival in New England. I mean, and they were going to have problems because of food supply anyways, but Weston and his group showing up really did them a disservice. And at this point, we're in April of 1623, and here is where we can call it because of the rescue piece, and that is that the Weston colony has officially failed. So Weston's men, who have survived, are now absorbed into the Plymouth colony, and in April of 1623, Weston returns to Plymouth, but not how you would expect. Let's see what Bradford says about this. Mr. Weston came over with some fishermen under another name and disguised as a blacksmith. He got a boat and with a man or two came to see how things were there. But on the way ashore, he was caught in a storm and his shallop sunk in the bay. He fell into the hands of Indians who robbed him of all that he had saved from the wreck and stripped him of his clothes and shirt. Thomas Weston clearly is an interesting character in American history, somebody we don't really know much about. He shows up disguised can't even get to shore in the boat, and then is robbed and stripped of his clothes. And it's, and it's just, it's an incredible story, and an odd individual. I, I'm, I must say I am shocked uh, to just read that somebody would be like this in, in the Plymouth Colony. Weston ends up borrowing clothes from another native tribe and making his way to Plymouth. Now, I don't think natives carried traditional English clothing with them. So Weston comes over in one disguise and probably ends up dressed like a native in another disguise when he gets to the village. And despite all of this, despite his past, the, the pilgrims help him by lending him 100 beaver skins weighing 170 pounds. Bradford notes that he used this to supply himself again, probably through trade, and never paid them back. Bradford shifts gears towards preventing another food shortage by allowing households to plant their own gardens. So before this, it was a community garden, and now people are allowed to plant their own food. Very interesting here. Bradford notes that with women willing to work in the fields, it would save the colony a great deal of trouble. And that makes sense considering you've got to defend the colony, you've got to 
and, and you can't grow all your food. You got to go out and fish. You got to trade. So there's a lot of things that have to go on and everybody has to play a role here. So women are now going out and tending the fields. Uh, again, finding ways to be productive and to build that food supply. Bradford goes on to mention that this shift towards private property was more satisfying to the colonists. Prior to this, they had operated the colony under a communal structure that had bred, quote, confusion and discontent. The communal method's source of discontentment came from women who had to do service for men who were not their husbands, young men whose work benefited older or less productive men. So it's interesting to see the shift in methods and how people seem to be pleased with it, and it looks like it's something that's going to work. Now, for fishing, the colony only had one boat, and this is important. This is, again, part of why you're going to have trouble maximizing your uh, food supply because you've only got one boat. But to increase the output that that boat provides, they had multiple fishing crews take shifts with the boat in and out of the harbor. So the boat was always working, but there were crews that could rest. The colony appears now to have taken a turn towards self-sustainability and is reducing trade with the natives considering the circumstances and a lot of this is reflected in the fact that Bradford and Winslow in their writings throughout 1623 do not really discuss many if any native interactions. In late July early August two ships come to Plymouth carrying more colonists. While things may be sounding better as described throughout this episode, Bradford notes that the colonists who arrived thought differently. Let's have a look. The passengers, when they saw the poor condition of those ashore, were much daunted and dismayed, and according to their different characters were differently affected. Some wished themselves in England again. Others began weeping, fancying what their own misery would be from what they saw before them. Others pitied the distress they saw their friends had been in so long and still were under, in a word, all were full of sadness. Plymouth goes from this December 1621 letter of how great things are to 1623 where people are weeping as they see the condition of the colony and thinking, is this going to happen to me? Uh, these pilgrims were working hard to make the colony sustainable. Unfortunately, we do not know if these new colonists were other Puritans, merchants, or a combination of the two. Bradford goes on to describe the condition of the settlers in a little more detail. Let's have a look. Many were ragged in apparel, and some little better than half naked, though some few were well enough clothed. But as for food, they were all alike, except some had got a few peas from the ship that was last there. The best dish they could present to their friends was a lobster or a piece of fish without any bread or anything else but a cup of fair spring water. While the new colonists were afraid, so were the current colonists. Let's have a look. Now the original settlers were afraid that their corn, when it was ripe, would have to be shared with the newcomers and that the provisions which the latter had brought with them would give out before the year was over, as indeed they did. So new colonists come, they're poorly supplied, and the existing colonists are like, wait a second, we don't have enough to support these people, and so it creates... Uh, a, a further strain on the, su on the supply system and stresses the colony. The colonists went to Bradford and requested that they be allowed to do as they please with their corn and not be forced to share it. The colonists believed that they could trade some of their corn for supplies with the new group as seen fit. So the new group apparently had a surplus of supplies 
and not food. And the new colonists did have some food supplied to them. So they weren't like starving the minute they showed up. Bradford agrees to this plan. Fall of 1623 provides a harvest for the colony that was sufficient, although Bradford notes some of the new colonists who hoped to have great things, like great houses, ended up with, quote, castles in the air. I love that saying, castles in the air. Edward Winslow was sent back with one of the two ships to England in September, which is likely where he finished his Good News from New England, which would be published in 1624. Bradford notes that certain conditions were agreed upon by the colony. These appear to be the first laws of Plymouth since the Mayflower Compact and subsequent Pierce Patent. They include the following. Colonists could be compelled into employment in the name of the common defense of the colony. Every man over the age of 16 will pay a bushel of Indian wheat towards the common store. So a tax of Indian wheat. Per the merchants, there will be no trade with the natives. So there you have it. No trade with the natives. So those rules are among what's set up as the original, uh, I guess, laws of the colony, if you will. In September, Captain Robert Gorgeous arrives to start his own colony. And at the time, Thomas Weston returns in a small ship. So <laughs> here comes uh, Mr. Weston again. Gorgeous accuses Weston of crimes but no other action comes of it. Later that fall, a fire breaks out in Plymouth, destroying houses and the supplies of several of the colonists. The house where the fire started was up against the common storehouse, and the colony would have been completely destroyed had the fire spread. Bradford mentions that the source of the fire was suspicious. Gorgeous, a captain, now starting his new colony and, and off, sends word that Mr. Weston needs to be arrested. Bradford actually tries to change Gorgeous's mind, and he is unsuccessful. Gorgeous ends up seizing Weston and his ship, only to bear the additional expense of supplying his men. So Weston was so broke that he couldn't supply his own men, and Gorgeous ends up doing it in the seizure. Weston is therefore released and makes his way to Virginia. And we did not, you know, this is in 1623, we did not see anything about him showing up in Virginia. Of course, Virginia was much bigger than Plymouth at the time, so he could blend in. Gorgeous' settlement would eventually fail. But Bradford mentions other settlements starting up the coast in 1623. And we're going to break away from Plymouth and talk about those settlements next time on Historical Context. <laughs>